Hallelujah and blessings in King Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Be Ye Holy Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, I trust this finds you feeling blessed in Jesus, that you are growing every day to be more in love with him and a desire, an insatiable desire for his holy word is being created within you and you are spending much time reading and studying his word. And by doing so, your life is being transformed in ways you never knew possible. In a world where there are many voices being presented to us on a daily basis, isn't it a great comfort to know as the people of God that God has preserved his word over time so that we can draw upon its truths, its promises, its warnings each and every day to guide our lives, to ensure that when we stand before our Lord, he looks upon us and says those most famous of words, Thou good and faithful servant. Well, friends, we're continuing our study in the series, What Does the Bible Say About? And today I want to present to you a topic that is sometimes misunderstood and often overlooked. And it's the beginning of our journey. It's where our journey begins as followers of the Lord Jesus. And what must take place and so as you noticed in the title, we're going to talk about repentance today. Now, the word repentance, if you looked it up in the Greek or the Hebrew, basically means to turn back, turn away from, not to be swept into the progressive way of this world, but to turn back to the simplicity that God has instilled within his word and he calls each and every one of his followers to. And with this idea of repentance or turning back, a key word that we must understand, a concept that we must understand is this idea of transparency. I had someone ask me one time, what is prayer? And in its simplicity, prayer is simply transparency. It's laying our lives completely open to the Lord who sees all things anyway and we hide nothing from him and we confess everything that there is about us that we don't like and we seek his strength, his wisdom, and his power to overcome those frailties within our flesh. And that's what repentance is. So in order to understand repentance, it's important that obviously we move our way through the scriptures. So if you have your Bible in front of you, we're going to look at a lot of different texts this morning. And I want to begin in Mark chapter 1, where we are told in verse 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. This is the beginning. This is where it started. Now, as it is written in the prophets, in the Old Testament, behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Now, this is speaking of a prophet who's going to prepare the way of the Messiah. In verse 3, it says, He will be the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Now, John did baptize in the wilderness. So verse 4 tells us John is that prophet, John the Baptist. And he was baptizing in the wilderness and preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins or for the forgiveness of sins. So repentance must take place before the forgiveness of sins. And it says in verse five, there went out unto him all the land of Judea and they of Jerusalem. And they were all baptized of him, John, in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. So we see closely connected with the idea of, uh, of repentance is this idea of confession. 
And confession is where the transparency comes in because we lay our lives open before our Lord as an open book, hiding nothing from him, but repenting and confessing of our sins And in this idea of repenting, after we've confessed our sins, we're going to turn away from those sins and we're going to do everything in our power to ensure we don't commit those sins again. Now it says in verse six, John was clothed with camel's hair and with a girdle of skin about his loins, and he did eat locust and wild honey. And John preached saying, there cometh one mightier than I after me the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I, John, indeed have baptized you with water, but he, the Messiah, the Lord, shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. You will be submersed in water in in recognition that you have repented and confessed your sins, but he, the Lord, will submerse you in the Holy Spirit. Now, that's a beautiful image. It's a beautiful concept, a beautiful idea of what Jesus does for us. And we are submersed in the spirit of God, in the character of God. Everything that God is, there's a desire in us now to become. Well, in verse 9, it says, It came to pass in those days that Jesus, the Lord, the Messiah, he came from Nazareth of Galilee. And he was baptized of John in Jordan. Now, Jesus had never sinned, so there was no need for his repentance. There was no need for any confession. But in order to fulfill the law, Jesus began his ministry here. And it says in verse 10, straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened and the spirit of God like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. And immediately the spirit driveth him, Jesus, into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan, and was with the wild beast, and the angels ministered unto him. Now what took place here, that Jesus was He was tempted in all measures as we are. We're told that later in the New Testament. And he wasn't tempted in every small aspect of every sin that you and I face, but he was tempted in the three categories of sin that we're told about in 1 John. The lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. He was tempted to turn the stone into bread. That's the lust of the flesh because he was hungry. The lust of the eye, he was taken upon a pinnacle and shown all the kingdoms of the world. Satan offered them to him if he would only bow down and worship. That's the lust of the eye. And then the pride of life. Prove yourself to be God. Throw yourself down and see if the angels pick you up before you hit the ground. So he challenged Jesus's pride. And so Jesus was tempted in all measures as we are simply because he faced the three major categories of sin, which every single sin that you and I know about will fall into one of those three categories, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, or the pride of life. But what's important here is that we see before Messiah arrived on the scene, John paved the way by saying that you must repent and you must confess. Now notice what it says in verse 14. After John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And what is the gospel? What is the good news of the kingdom of God? Well, this is what Jesus said in verse 15. The time is fulfilled. The time has come. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. So even Jesus begins his ministry with the message that we must repent. Repentance is the key concept in becoming, it's the initial concept in becoming a follower of the Lord Jesus. Now with that in mind, let's turn to 2 Corinthians and let's look at chapter 7 and verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10. It says, For godly sorrow works repentance to salvation. Not human sorrow, but godly sorrow. You see, there's a lot of things that people who don't even know the Lord Jesus are sorry for each day. You can talk to a local alcoholic 
who's just come from the tavern or someone who's just come from a casino and lost all their money. And they're certainly sorry for the time they spent in that establishment. But this points out to us that godly sorrow works repentance to salvation. So what is godly sorrow? Well, let's continue. Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 11, and let's begin at verse 13. I'm sorry, that's Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. Now, this is what Solomon, and Jesus says Solomon is the wisest man that ever lived. This is what King Solomon says at the end of his life in verse 13 of chapter 12. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. When everything comes down to where the rubber meets the road, this is the conclusion that we are left with. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. So repentance begins with the understanding of fearing God. The reason we repent is because we fear the judgment of God. We fear the wrath of God, not only in the life to come, but in this life. Now turn to Proverbs chapter 9, and let's look together at verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, if you as a follower of Jesus seek any gift, the greatest gift that we can seek is the gift of wisdom. We want to understand the word of God. But the Bible tells us here in order to understand the word of God, the things of God, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of that journey. Why? Because when we fear the Lord, it brings us to godly sorrow, which leads to repentance, which leads to salvation, which is accompanied by transparency. And in laying ourselves open before the Lord as an open book, now the Lord is able to open our eyes and show us things that we haven't seen before. Flip one chapter back in Proverbs chapter 8 and look at verse 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. But not only evil, pride. Pride within the world that we live in and that we see in others, but certainly pride within ourselves. And arrogancy, thinking too highly of ourselves. And the evil way. And the froward mouth. The mouth that speaks whatever it wants and whenever it wants. It is undisciplined. And so the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, arrogancy, the evil way, and the froward mouth. And the reason that we are to hate those things is because that's what God hates. And each and every one of us can look in our lives and see where we have failed in those disciplines, and that, of course, should lead us to repentance. You see, repentance isn't something that we did one time and we never have to do it again. Repentance is a daily occurrence for the follower of the Lord Jesus because we're at war with our flesh. And sometimes, maybe oftentimes, our flesh wins out more than the Spirit of God within us. But as we train ourselves and as we discipline ourselves and as we grow in the Lord, there will come a time, and this is a, a, an encouragement to you if you're battling with these things, as you grow in the Lord and in his word and the spirit of God strengthens himself within you, there will become a time where the spirit will become stronger than the flesh. But that's not going to happen overnight, just like a four-year-old doesn't go to sleep and wake up a teenager. It's going to take work, discipline, and time in order to become the man or woman of God that you want to be. Well, now, how does this take place? For that answer, let's turn to Ezekiel, and let's look at chapter 14 to begin with. Ezekiel chapter 14. We're going to read in verse 6. Now, it says, Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Repent, and turn yourselves from your idols, and turn away your faces from all your abominations. And what I want us to see in this passage is the idea of turning. 
turning away from the things that we know bring God displeasure and turning to the Lord, turning away from this world because he who is a friend of this world is an enemy of God and instead setting all of our sight, all of our hope upon the kingdom of God. And as Jesus said, seek first the kingdom and then all of the things shall be taken care of. We'll turn forward a few chapters to Ezekiel chapter 18, and let's look at verse 30. God says, Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one according to his ways. Now put your name in there. Therefore will I judge you, Don. Therefore will I judge you, fill in the blank, every one according to his own ways, saith the Lord God. Repent. And turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Again, repent, turn from all transgressions, all things that God has forbidden, from the simplest of things to what we would consider the major sins. Turn from these things. Well, let's turn to Isaiah chapter 1, and let's look at verses 16 and 17. Now, keep in mind what we're doing here is we're seeing that this is a message that is presented throughout the entirety of the word of God. And in Isaiah chapter one, verse 16, it says, wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do well. This isn't something that we're born with. We're born the desire to do evil. But God says here, we need to learn to do well. We need to train ourselves to do well. We need to discipline ourselves to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Fight for those who are weaker, who cannot fight for themselves. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. But in order for this to take place, we must do what it says in verse 16 and 17. Wash ourselves, make ourselves clean, prepare ourselves for the Lord, put away the evil of our doings before God's eyes. He sees it all anyway. Cease to do evil, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. Look what it says in Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 19. Surely after that I was turned, I repented. And after I was instructed, I smote upon my thigh. I was ashamed, yes, even confounded, because I did bear the reproach of my youth. I made a lot of mistakes and it brought me much shame. But when I repented, when I confessed my sins, as Isaiah told us, he washed us, he made us clean, he made us white as snow. And though our sins were like crimson, he made them as wool. He purified us, he cleansed us. And upon doing so, we now understand we owe our lives to him. And that's why we seek so desperately to learn to do well, to train ourselves and discipline ourselves so that we can become better followers of the Lord Jesus each and every day. Now turn to Luke chapter three. And of course, we're back at the story of John the Baptist. But when John said repent, what did he mean and what did the people understand John to mean when he spoke to them that day? Well, let's begin at verse 2, halfway into verse 2. It says, The word of God came unto John the Baptist, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he, John, came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission or the forgiveness of of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be brought low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough ways shall be made smooth and all flesh shall 
shall see the salvation of God. Then said he, John, to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits that are worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you, God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Well, the people hearing what John was saying immediately became stricken in their hearts. And so they asked John saying, what shall we do? And listen to what John says. John says unto them, he who has two coats, let him impart to him that has none. And he that has meat, let him do likewise. Well, now this isn't of the natural order. The natural order isn't to give unto others to bring them comfort. It's to hoard to ourselves, not worrying about other people. But John says the opposite. He says, I want you to go against the natural and I want you to learn to do well. I want you to give to someone who doesn't have a coat because you have more than one. And I want you to feed someone who is hungry and cannot feed themselves because you have plenty of food. Well, now hearing this, the publicans came to John to be baptized. And they said unto John, Master, what shall we do? You've told the common people what they're to do. We're the publicans. What are we to do? And John said unto them, Exact or take no more than that which is appointed you. Don't live greedy and certainly don't take advantage of other people in order to feed your greed, but only take what is appointed unto you. Well, now the soldiers, hearing what John has said to the common people and what he has said to the publicans, they want to know what it is they're to do to be received by God. And so the soldiers in verse 14, likewise demanded of John saying, what shall we do? And John said unto them, do violence to no man. Do you hear those words? These are soldiers. That's their appointment. That's their job. That's their duty handed down to them by their king. And yet John says, do violence to no man. Do not accuse anyone falsely and be content with your wages. Boy, that's something we need to learn in this day and age. Be content with the wages that we've been given. Don't seek more. Don't seek more opportunities. Be content where you are and understand that all good things, even in the simplest form, even in the smallest form, come from the hand of the Father. When I look at verse 15, it says, All the people were in expectation, and all men mused in their hearts of John whether he were the Christ, whether he was the Messiah or not. And so in verse 16, John answers them saying, I indeed baptize you with water. I will submerge you in water and your sins will be forgiven for doing so. Because this is an act of your repentance and your confession. But there is one mightier than I cometh, the latches of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. And although you take great comfort in the fact I've baptized you in water, and therefore your sins have been forgiven because of your repentance and your confession of sins, there is one who is going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He's going to submerge you in the Holy Spirit, and you will no longer wrestle with your sins as you once did, because the now the Spirit of God lives within you, enabling you to overcome sin, to live free of sin. And that's the difference in the baptism of John and the baptism of Jesus. And I did a video on that. So if you want to know more about that, go find the video in our playlist that I believe was entitled The Three Baptisms. Well, now that we've confessed our sins, 
now that we have repented of our sins, we're turning away from the things of the world and we're drawing nigh to the things of God, we're disciplining ourselves and we're learning to do well, this is where the statement of Jesus is so important when he begins his sermon on the mount in Matthew chapter 5. And notice what Jesus says. He begins in verse 3 and he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, the poor in spirit are those who are broken before the Lord. And this is because they fear God. They fear his judgment. They fear his wrath. They understand that they are sinners and they're looking for, through their confession, the forgiveness of sin. And Jesus says, when you come to this point in your life, you are blessed because you are now poor in spirit. You're not haughty. You're not high-minded. You don't think too much of yourself, but you're poor in spirit. Then that will bring mourning. Blessed are those that mourn, he says in verse 4. You see, this is a process that takes place. We're broken in spirit and we begin to weep before the Lord because we see our failures, we see our sin, and we're in such great need of his salvation, of his forgiveness. And this brings about a meekness, a humility, not pride, not arrogancy, but meekness in verse 5, and humility. And this will lead us to, in verse 6, hungering and thirsting after the things of God. I remember the day that I was born again, the day that I met the Lord Jesus and he introduced himself to me. The greatest desire in my soul at that very moment was the word of God. And I began to consume the word of God. I read and read and read and studied everything that I could find, every teaching that I could find on the word of God because I was so hungry and so thirsty after righteousness. And this, of course, causes us in verse 7 to be merciful unto others because we understand the two great commandments of God, to love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And we understand as we treat others is as we would treat the Lord. So we become merciful unto others, meeting their needs. And this causes us in verse 8 to be pure before the Lord, pure in heart, because we are learning to do well. And this is why we are told, and we have discussed in other videos, that Ezekiel tells us in chapter 36, verse 26, well, actually, let's pick up in verse 25. God says, I will then sprinkle clean water upon you and you will be clean from all your filthiness, all your past sins, all your idols. I will cleanse you, promises the Lord. And a new heart, he, he's not going to change the old heart. He's going to exchange your heart. He's going to take out the heart of old and a new heart he will give you and a new spirit, a new desire, a new passion, I will put within you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you. We read those words too lightly, friend. The spirit of the almighty, the spirit of the king of the universe, he has offered to place within us and because of this, we will be caused to walk in the statutes of God. We will keep his judgments and we will do them. Look at Romans chapter 2 and verse 4. Paul asked the question, do we despise the riches of the goodness and forbearance and long suffering of God, not knowing that it is the goodness of God that leads you to repentance? It is because he was merciful to us. It is because he was patient with us. He was long-suffering. He was kind. It is because of these attributes of God that we see that he was willing to be patient with us as we acted like spoiled children, and this causes us to repent before him. We see the love that is, is pouring forth from him in waiting so patiently as we act so foolishly and in understanding his love for us, maybe for the first time, we now bow before him and surrender unto him. Look at Second Peter chapter 3 
in verse 9. It says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men would count slackness, but it is long suffering to usward, his ability to wait us out through our many acts of foolishness, because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to what? Repentance. You see, it all begins with repentance. It's necessary that we begin with truly repenting before God, laying ourselves transparently open before him, confessing the smallest to the greatest uh, sin in our lives, going back and walking through our lives day by day as much as we can remember and confessing all before him, knowing that we have done everything that we can to empty ourselves and now allowing those empty places within us to be filled with his Holy Spirit, enabling us now for the first time in our lives to overcome sin. And that's what Romans chapter six is so clear in presenting to us that we now have power to live victorious over sin. We're no longer slaves to sin, but we're slaves to righteousness. We have been freed from sin. We're dead to sin. And sin is no longer therefore to live within us. We have the victory, hallelujah. And this, of course, brings us to the most famous repentance verse in all of the Bible. And we see this in 1 Chronicles or I'm sorry, 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14, where it says, if my people, those whom I have called, if they will humble themselves, and if we are to confess our sins in repentance, it begins with a humble attitude. So step number one, we must humble ourselves. Then we must begin to talk to God in confession or what the Bible says here, we must pray. Once we've humbled ourselves and we've prayed, step three, we must begin to seek his face. We turn away from the world which we once gazed upon and now we're looking unto the Lord, unto his kingdom and we're hungering for his righteousness. And finally, step four, we turn from our wicked ways. Then at that point, we will hear from heaven. God will answer. God will respond. This is a promise, friends. If we do these things, God will hear from heaven. He will forgive our sin and he will heal our land. And that's why John says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he Jesus is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so I hope through these scriptures today that you see clearly laid out in the word of God, the importance of repentance, not just on the day that we met the Lord, but a continual process of repentance as we seek to become better followers of the Lord Jesus each and every day. You see, there are too many people that are walking the earth today that believe just because they believe in Jesus that somehow they're saved. But the Bible tells us in James chapter 2, verse 19, the devils believe in Jesus, and surely they do. He's the one that created them. They believe in Jesus. They've seen him. They've spoken with him. So they believe in Jesus to a degree that you and I don't even believe. And that's not going to save them. What they haven't done that you and I are offered to do is they have not repented. And there are many people, the majority, I would say, that call themselves Christians today, and yet they haven't repented. They haven't turned away from anything. There's no change in their lives. You don't see them hungry and thirsty after righteousness, but they're still the same people they were or they always have been. There's been no change. There's been no turning away from. There's been no repentance. And if that's you, friend, then I want you to get serious before God. I want you to be transparent before God. I want you to lay your life open to God like you would a book. And I want you to begin to talk to God. Humble yourself. See the great need that you have for the forgiveness of your sins. And because 
He has given his life for you in saving you and in bringing you back into fellowship with God. You now understand you owe your life to him and you deny yourself daily. Take up your cross and follow him with every ounce of energy you have within your soul. And if you do that, friends, he has promised to forgive you, to cleanse you, to wash you, to purify you. So that when God looks upon you, he doesn't see you any longer, but he sees Jesus in you, Jesus covering you, Jesus shielding you and protecting you from the judgment of God. That's what the good news is, but it must begin with repentance. Well, I love you, friends. I'm so grateful again that you you chose to take a few moments out of your day and invest yourself in the Word of God. And I pray that the Word of God will find root within you, bringing much fruit in your life. Now, as he wills and until next time, friends, I truly love you. I'll see you on the next video.